So my name is Jennifer Cox, and I've been working in the tech industry for 15 years now this year. Uh, the last five of them with Tenable, working with our existing customer base and helping to consult and advise them on best practices when it comes to cybersecurity and um, everything around that, really. But today, what I'm going to do is talk about something that is more of a personal interest of mine and really doesn't bear any uh, direct relation, I guess, to what I do as a job. So we'll start from the beginning. So what is social engineering? Um, some of you may have heard of somebody called Kevin Mitnick. I would like to think so anyway, if you have an interest in social engineering at all. He's a very high profile hacker who spent five years in prison um, as a result of his talents, shall we say. Um, he almost exclusively helped to popularize the term social engineering back in the 1990s, and he made a career out of what it was that he does. Um, and now he runs his own security consultancy firm, and he is an author of a number of different books around social engineering that I would absolutely recommend that you um, read if you get a chance to. So his definition of social engineering, taken directly from his Art of Deception book, is social engineering uses influence and persuasion to deceive people by convincing them that the social engineer is somebody he isn't or by manipulation. Much better than any of those dictionary definitions that actually make sense what it is that he's doing. And of course, with the nature of anything um, in the in the world, wonderful world of IT and security and cyber, um, the terms tend to change over time. So I'm just putting up a list there of a few of, I want to say the, the lesser known terms when it comes to social engineering. You may well know um, some of them. Uh, you may well not know any of them. I'll cover a couple, but I won't go through them all in any great detail because um, there's quite a bit that I want to cover today. But just to, to cover the base, ground, uh, base level as such. So things like spear phishing would be targeting um, a high level contact, someone like a CEO of a company, but using pretexting um, with regards researching and find out, finding out information in relation to that individual and making it a very targeted approach. So you're not just looking for general information or doing something like phishing where you're sending an email, an email out to a mass number of targets and hoping that somebody will click on it. In this particular case, you'll be gathering information very specific to that individual, whether it's on a professional or a personal basis, in order to make your, your attack um, much more targeted in its approach. And then there's the physical type of social engineering. So something like tailgating. It sounds so simple um, and works so effectively. So where you would um, it, it pretend to be somebody that you're not, such as maybe a delivery person and you're holding a box and you ask somebody to hold the door open for you. Um, in order to gain entry into uh, an office building or well, whatever the building is then from there. So all you need to do is be pretty convincing, whether it's the clothes you wear or the disposition that you have, um, and uh, they'll let you through the door in um, most cases without any questions asked. And then at the bottom of the list, there is something we're seeing more activity on recently, which is smishing. And that's around getting text messages with links. So and um, there was a spate of bank ones last year. I click on these details to, to confirm your online login details and um, things like uh, confirm your COVID vaccine appointment and um, your parcel delivery. Um, we're seeing an increase in, uh, an increased um, in, increase in those kind of attacks, especially uh, susceptible to people who maybe aren't as technical, but um, like, all the same still happening. And then the chances are, when it comes to social engineering, on some level, you have done it as well. So you may not be thinking, woohoo, I'm a social engineer uh, and all of the different terminology around it. But if you stop for a minute and think about it in its most simple form as such, um, let's say, uh, in theory, that when you were younger, um, you or a friend uh, that you know uh, used a fake ID in order to buy alcohol. Not that this happens a whole lot, but that's the same idea. It's very simple that they're using something to convince a person that they are something that they're not in order to gain, uh, to win or uh, gain some property in this case from that individual, which would be the alcohol. Um, or maybe you went into a cinema at 15 years of age to see an over 12s movie and then dodged out of that one and went in to see the over 18s. The same idea you've gained access to something that you shouldn't have gained access to under the pretext of being somebody that you're not. Um, most people do it with, uh, without realizing it, do the shoulder surfing, as uh, we would refer to another one of the tactics. So let's say you're on public transport, you're sitting on a train, you're bored, the scenery is not so good. Uh, the person beside you is answering emails on their phone or arguing with their boyfriend and um, watching something on Netflix, typing away on their laptop. It's often more interesting to just have a look at what they're doing 
Um, and without realizing that often these people can give away a significant amount of information about themselves um, in a very, very small space of time. So for me, uh, I would say recently, but it's when we used to be able to fly last and we all know that that's not been very recent. So I was on a plane. We were sitting on the tarmac. Our flight was going to be delayed for 40 minutes. Um, so I thought I'll amuse myself and let's see what mischief I can get up to really and what information I can find out about the people sitting closest to me. So I'm in a three seat row. I'm sitting by the window. There's a, a gentleman sitting beside me and then a lady beside him. None of us knew each other. Um, but fortunately for me, the man who sat beside me obviously forgot his reading glasses and held his phone a good 18 inches away from his face while he was using it, which meant that I could easily do some shoulder surfing without him having any idea that I was doing it because I didn't even have to turn my head to look at what he was doing. And while I was having a look um, in the space of maybe five or six minutes, I managed to identify the company that I was working for. And they used a full name and um, full surname in the email uh, address and then the email address of the name of the company, obviously. So I was able to search for him on LinkedIn, find out his role, find out what he did, um, find out what his company did. It was an engineering and manufacturing um, and then he was on WhatsApp talking to his family. He had two uh, adult children. He was talking to his wife about the hotel he was staying in, the date he was coming back, when he expected to be arriving at the hotel, where he had parked his car, and simple conversation that he was innocently having with his family. And I was um, clocking up all of this data, this information about him, and yet I'd not even spoken to him at most bump elbows at this point. But the most interesting thing is right up to that point, he wasn't an interesting target. And I had no intentions of exploiting this particular individual. It was just an interesting exercise to pass the time. Um, but the next thing that he did after that was he went onto a website where he was looking at bids for antique coins. And these coins then were having bids submitted against them. And he also placed some bids against these coins, which were in the, between the value of about 2,000 euro up to about 10,000 euro. So, of course, this individual who was doing nothing more exciting than the person next to him uh, right up to that moment wasn't an interesting target. But as soon as he was putting a $10,000 bid on an antique coin, he suddenly became way more interesting to me. But like I say, in that space of time, just for the sake of amusement, I was able to find out quite a lot about his employer, employer himself, his employment, the amount of money that he clearly has um, to play with his family, his location, his intended behavior over the next few days. And I didn't have to try. I didn't even have to ask him any questions. And that's just using the shoulder surfing technique then from there. And like I say, the chances are you've seen some information like that from individuals without even realizing it. It doesn't make you or nor me um, excellent at it, but it certainly shows you how easily some of these tactics can be used. So recently, we've had a few high profile human attacks, as I'll uh, call them. And by recently, 2020, 2021, everything, obviously everything is massively different uh, between this year and last year. So it's made some of these things a little bit more interesting. Um, and specifically, what we've had is uh, an attack in 2020, summer 2020, um, on Twitter. So there was three individuals who managed to use means of social engineering to get um, information from Twitter employees um, around the um, admin platform um, for Twitter. So it meant that they were able to get access to uh, pretty much any Twitter users, uh, logins and posts, uh, identification with regards to verified accounts and things like that behind the scenes. And they did it. it. It's believed that they did it through a chat portal, made friends with these individuals and managed to get this information from them potentially um, by bribing them. But that's unconfirmed. So I, I, can't, I cannot stick by that one. But what these individuals did then is once they got access to these accounts and most of them were uh, verified. So blue tick accounts, meaning that they've had to um, confirm who they are, use some form of identification. And they probably have a significant number of followers then as well in order to be a ver verified account. These individuals targeted 130 accounts um, and uh, 45 of them they managed to successfully hack. So that means that of those 45 accounts, so there were people like Joe Biden um, before he was the president, uh, Elon Musk, and then former president Barack Obama, I think Kim Kardashian. So ones that have a significant number of followers, they posted cryptocurrency links 
via these people's sites. And of course, people who follow them, there's always going to be some believed because it was from a verified user that these links were in fact genuine, even though the link stated, send your cryptocurrency here and we will send you back double. And most of us in the area that we work in, I would like to think would see that as a suspicious activity, but there's always some. Um, and as a result, in a very short space of time, these individuals managed to steal over $118,000. But of course, the the immaturity of their attack as such meant that people reported them pretty quickly. They were um, discovered and arrested and didn't get any further than that. But $118,000 is not a small um, win for such such a small amount of effort, I guess, from there. And then there's the Instagram Russia attack. So what happened here is that the social engineers managed to target some fake news posts on, on Instagram. So they pretended to be one of the three straight state-run television networks and announced a government payout scheme. So all people had to do was to click on the link and enter in their um, bank details, their personal information, and the equivalent of their PPS number in order to get their payout from the government or at least that's how it seemed. And it was a pretty successful attack, successful enough to make headline news in Russia. Um, and they very easily managed to get that personally identifying information from individuals on the head of a promise of cash in their pocket. And one of the more recent uh, and more, I guess, uh, common types that we've seen now are the phishing attacks across things like um, Amazon Prime Day or Black Friday, Christmas because people are working from home and uh, a lot of the stores have been closed and everybody's locked down, basically, a lot of our transactions more than ever before are being done online and people are much more dependent on basic things through this means. So getting an email perfectly timed saying that your transaction has failed and your order won't arrive um, is catching more and more people out in 2020 than it would have done previously. Phishing still proven to be a pretty successful means of attack. Um, and with that, you'll have people entering in their bank details, credit card details, personal information, passwords for the sites and readily handing it over. And especially around times like Christmas, where you're waiting for maybe um, special person gifts to arrive and um, you uh, people will panic when they see it and think that this isn't going to arrive. The delivery is held and they put in their information before thoroughly vetting the details that are there. In often cases, when it comes to things like phishing attacks, most people will see through them. Um, you know, most people are capable of that. It's all about perfect timing. If you're particularly stressed, um, let's say about that package coming for Christmas and you get an email uh, right at that precise moment where you're stressing the most about it or there's not enough time for it to arrive. Of course, that's a very um, perfect opportunity for you to click on these things. And then finally, and uh, something that we've seen since 2020 is COVID related attacks. So we're seeing more and more um, smishing attacks where people are getting text messages around uh, contacts, close contacts that have been um, that they've been that they've been in contact with, or uh, vaccine appointments and promises to you know register your information here and to get details from that. And then of course uh, phishing emails around the same thing. I know that Jason saw, showed us some of those in his. Um, his uh, delivery this morning, and then calls from people saying that they're from health services and want to set up appointments and to confirm personal information from there. And fear is what um, means, what enables people to hand over this kind of information for these attacks, because everybody wants their vaccine and everybody wants the world to go back to whatever the new normal is going to be. So they'll hand over that information readily um, to these calls and from there. So what can you do to prevent against social engineering? Um, and social engineering humans. Obviously, there's a lot of technical capabilities that you can put in place um, to, to protect your network and protect your infrastructure and protect your building. But today, what we're concerned about is how we best deal with our, our humans and have help them to protect us and our businesses from there. So it seems obvious we talk about security awareness training. We want to make sure that everybody has all of the basics. So you're talking about these super simple basics like clean desk policies, like storage, when you have your um, employees going back to the office, bear in mind for a lot of companies, they've been out of their offices for up to a year. Um, now we have to remind them, not only is it, you know, uh, not normal to, I don't know, break wind in front of your colleagues because you've been at home working in your home office for so long, but it's also to, to remind them of some of these habits that they should have in place, not leaving personally identifying information on the desk, having lock storage to put it into, using that lock storage, 
shredding confidential information. And then if they're dealing with um, personally identifying information that they have additional GDPR training alongside that so that they're aware of the implications for the company when it comes to things like fines um, for mistreating that information or, or it being um, exposed in some way. And then for those on the access side of things, it's, it's a perfect time and it should happen often to review IDs and review um, permissions. You'll have people who uh, won't return to the office straight away, some who will return part time, some who will be on sick leave for extended periods. It's really important to check that and they'll be in different roles. So it's really important to check that their access does continue to match the role that they have um, and that uh, it's updated on a regular basis then from there. But the most important thing when it comes to um, uh, enabling your employees is the simulation and the testing side of things. So um, it's again, it's something that Jason mentioned earlier this morning, that it's much more important that people feel these incidents than just doing 10 minute training uh, once a year where they tick the box and say, I've done the video and now I'm good for my um, my social engineering or anti-social engineering training for the year. That's not effective. You're talking about humans. And if humans are constantly interacting with something, then it's much more likely that it's going to be an automatic process for them to question what's happening around them. And if you are facilitating training once a year, that's not going to be effective. And it's really about considering the weight of importance of that protection via your humans. Um, and simulation and testing is the best way to do that. If somebody has been has clicked the phishing link, has given the details over the phone, and then they have to be uh, a part of a discussion afterwards about what they've done and uh, how to not do it again, then they're going to remember that conversation a lot better than they're going to remember a, a, a white page article with a couple of paragraphs about how you know what best practices there are there that aren't real to them. Then social media sharing. It's important to um, make your employees aware of the, the um, risks of social media sharing. So it's not just about the company sharing information that may be sensitive to the company or pictures of the office or photos of um, people in the office that might show screens in the background. It extends beyond that. If your employees are sharing um, personal information on social media, like they're, they were promoted and they were promoted into a significantly senior role or one that has a financial uplift that's worth talking about, and they mention that they may start seeing themselves um, or they may start becoming a target of a social, en social engineer within your company. And it's very, um, it's very easily overlooked. But what you would be asking to do is to advise them. You can't make them do it, but to advise them of the risks and make sure that they're aware of these kind of things. Then branded workwear is a funny one. I love a free T-shirt, same as anybody else. But when it comes to branded workwear, I would say that there's one place I wouldn't recommend wearing it. And that is in and around the office. Wear it anywhere that you want. But for me, most offices these days have key cards to get access into the office um, and people will wear their, their shirts and their hoodies and such with the brand on it. So if they're going out for their lunch, they're kind of a walk in advertisement um, for the, the business, which is great. But once they have the key card stuck in their back pocket or on the back of their phone or they're at risk of dropping it or losing it somewhere, um, they've done that whilst advertising the company that it belongs to and the access that's there. So I would be inclined to ask them to just cover up their logos um, or not wear them around the office and embrace all of that those, that free workwear <laughs> anywhere else that they are. But that's the only place I'd recommend not doing it. And then for the those who have to keep the asset infrastructure in place or the assets, um, the, yeah, the assets in place, uh, I would recommend against non-brand or against using branded asset tags. So it looks really cool having the company logo on your asset tags, but um. Again, if you have employees, and even though with the best of uh, intentions, they may not want to work on trains or planes or buses, but if they have, they're, they're using their phones or using their, their laptops and so on from there, um, and they have a sticker on it with an asset tag number and the logo or the name of the company, then again, it's kind of like a walking ad advertisement to the potential social engineer with regards to them being a target or whether the the kit that they're carrying around is likely to be of any value or have any um, data on it. And that's before you get into, obviously, the technical protection that you have in place. But the technical protection protection isn't a worry if there's no risk that your employees are going to expose the data like that. So 
I would recommend uh, using acid tags, of course, but to uh, not use your logos on those acid tags from there. But then the most important thing I would say is to normalize the conversation. If your employees are talking about um, social engineer hacks that they've heard about, blogs that they've read, that it's something that is always in conversation, whether it's through um, water, um, the, I can't remember what it's called, the water, water front <laughs> such in work where you're talking, or, uh, you know, any um, news blogs that go out across the rest of your employees where the da- the names of these kind of attacks are, are updated on the regular and everybody is well informed as to what's happening and how other people that they know have been caught out really, really easily, then these things are going to be at the forefront of the mind and they are going to think about it when they get a phone call that seems perfectly innocent from the tech support and they're looking for their password, that it's, it's natural for them to want to question those conversations. Again, if you're only having that conversation once a year and it's all through paperwork or online videos, then it's a whole lot less likely that they're going to remember it when it comes time. And then, for example, I have a colleague who um, worked for a company and there's the CEO of that company had set up a planned um, fake phishing attack for all the employees. Not that unusual. We've all had them sent to us. Um, he organized it on Friday that on four o'clock on Monday, the fake phishing email was going to go out. And uh, it was going to be in relation to speed and tickets. So he came into work on Monday and uh, put it around his day as normal. Then this email arrived into his inbox four o'clock as expected and said that he needed to pay a speeding fine um, urgently. And he panicked because on Saturday morning he had, of course, been stopped for speeding and was expecting a ticket and was wondering how the hell were they so efficient that they sent this ticket now? And I don't want my wife to find out about it. And what am I going to do? And he clicked on the link and he paid his ticket. And as soon as he hit submit on his payment, uh, that was the moment when he realized that he had fallen for his own uh, attack. So and then we call that a face palm moment. And then for me, I've had a, a, a tailgating incident, I guess, when I, for when I was working in an office and we had a new general manager that I hadn't met yet. So I had got, I was the first person in the office in the morning. Somebody came through the door behind me and um. I was tempted, as you would be, to not say anything. They seemed to know where they were going and they were about to head off to their desk. But I thought, I don't know this person. I'm the first one here. We have a new GM. I do not want to get called up on this one because we have a new GM. And so I turned around and I introduced myself to him and told him who I was. And he turned around and introduced himself back to me. And it turns out that it was, in fact, our new GM. So gold star for me. Thank goodness I didn't get caught out for that one. So in the event of an attack, if somebody has been successfully socially engineered in your office, how do you, um, what do you do? How do you get around that or what do you do in regards to learning from that? So the most important part, I would say, is no consequences. I really believe that if your employees feel safe in reporting an incident like this, then you're going to be in a much better position when it comes to protecting your data and protecting your employees. So if your employee is scared of retribution and thinks they're going to get fired for making a mistake and they don't tell you about it. There's only one thing worse than finding out that you've got someone in your office has been socially engineered and they've got, and the social engineers have got access to your network. And that's finding out about it days or weeks or months, or maybe not at all later. Um, So you want to make sure that your employees feel comfortable reporting it. I mean, there's always going to be the one who's a fool and keeps making mistakes all the time and you deal with that separately. But for the most part, people want to do the right thing and they want to be good people. Um, So you want to make sure that they feel comfortable reporting that stuff to you then. And then reward them. So if they do uh, notice suspicious behavior, whether it's among employees or people hanging around outside and they report it, then, you know, reward them by whatever means you deem necessary. If they hand in a USB key that's clearly not belonging to the company or wasn't issued by IT, again, good behavior, hand it in. Um, if they're reporting that their, their badge has been lost or stolen within uh, a certain amount of time or they hand in one belongs to somebody else or they forward on an email that looks like it's suspicious and send it on to the tech department, all of that behavior should be rewarded, should be incentivized in some way. Some people might go so far as to say it should be gamified. I do like that idea. I don't know how practical it is, but um, I would certainly make sure that people feel that it's the right thing to do. Because I can say for the most part, that's how they want to behave. And then if it happens, if somebody does manage to get um, to be socially engineered and hands over their password or something happens, then review that situation. You need to sit down and talk 
to not just them, get all the details of how it happened, what was said, what they gave over, what you did to uh, implement, what you implemented afterwards in order to protect the data and the individual um, and the company generally. Uh, but you need to take that review and send it back uh, across the, the greater employee, employee body and make sure that they're aware of what's happened. And then the last bit then is relearn. So again, not to do the training and assessment uh, once a year, keep bringing these new experiences into it, these new terminologies, anything at all, and make sure that it's a conversation that's happening all the time. The main point is that you want to keep that at the forefront of your employees' minds and um, otherwise they're not going to be able to defend you and your data when the time comes. And that is it. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you so much, Jenny, for that talk. Great insight. Um, there's no questions on the chat, but I, I, I have one myself I'd like to ask. So you mentioned that face palm moment. Um, <laughs> I actually seen something similar in an org one time before. In saying that, do you think that corporate fake phishing campaigns, um, are they a necessary evil from a compliance perspective? Or do you actually think they work to truly prepare staff for email-based social engineering attacks? And I know the edge case that this particular one just happened to hit the nail in the head from a timeliness perspective, but do you think they work in the, in the main? I do, because if you think about it, even outside of the corporate environment, it's working. Phishing is still one of the most successful means of social engineering. It hasn't really uh, become less effective. So if that's the one of the ways that people are more likely to get caught, then it makes sense to use it in, in work. But people should use it intelligently. I mean, I've seen fish, fake phishing emails that there's no way like a donkey could tell that it's a fake phishing email. You want to put a little bit of effort into making it more convincing because they're the ones that you're going to get caught on. Um, and that just takes a small bit of effort on the side of the company. And the people with the best of intentions, you'd be surprised always um, who will get caught. And almost always somebody will click on it, obviously depending on the size of the company. But um, I don't think it's, it's a negative for sure. Uh, people almost seem bored by it, yet they still click on the links. Yeah, and I, I guess similarly, we just got a question in um, in a similar vein. You mentioned, you know, an annual tick box exercise, white paper, video training. You know, it, it isn't as effective as it could be. But how, how would you go about it? You mentioned gamification as maybe a potential um, for improvement in the in that space. What's your thoughts on on that? Well, with gamification, I like the idea of. Um, like a reward scheme for people who do things like patching quickly. You know, the way you get a patch pushed out to your laptop, everybody hates it. They go, remind me in four hours, remind me tomorrow, remind me later and do all those things. But that if people are, in, are um, rewarded for doing it sooner rather than, than later, and like say for reporting uh, different types of activity, it makes them interact with that whole process. And um, as a human, the more interaction that you have with a particular type of, of behavior or task or challenge, whether it's that you're building bricks or that you're doing something like this, the more likely you are to retain that as a, um, as a natural uh, reaction, an automatic process, as I say, then after that. So that's, I mean, that's the way to do it. It has to be interactive. It has to be more hands-on. That's the way to do it. It has to be interactive. It has to be more hands-on. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure if you can hear me still. I'll just turn off the video again. there. Okay, yeah. excellent. And just to wrap it up, one last question. What's the most strangest or unusual socially, in, social engineering incident you've ever come across? Um, for me, it's usually the, the physical one. So I've seen, I've, I, I guess it's more when you look at those kind of like magic trick style ones where somebody is using the, the method of distraction um, and uh, taking something physically off an individual. So it's, it's like, you can't fathom that. I can fathom clicking on an email and I can fathom letting somebody in the door behind me. We're polite people. We want people to like us. And this kind of behavior is natural in that sense. But somebody actually taking something physically from me under the, the pretense of or using the distraction behaviors in order to do that, that kind of stuff um, gets me. And thankfully, personally, at least, as not as far as I'm aware of, I haven't been targeted with anything um, more than the, the, the person next door. 
But um, I'm always fascinated by those ones when people can do something as obvious as lift somebody's, you know, watch or hat or handbag out of their hands without anyone noticing by just using some simple social engineering techniques such as um, distraction and replacement, things like that. Excellent. We're on time. So thank you very much, Jenny, for a great insight into social engineering and some of your thoughts. Thank you for being part of our event. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks.